So um, this first screen is basically what I do. Um, and I'm, when I am the editor in chief, what happens is I get to see all the studies that will be published in several months from now, but I get to read them now. It's, really, it's a very interesting process. And here, basically this information is for everybody. Um, and it's all to help people and educate people about medicine. Uh, I was asked today, why do I do these things? And that was a very good question, I thought, because I think there's so, so much misinformation on the internet, and there's so many so-called experts, and so-called, and they, and they title themselves as doctors, but they've, I don't, many of them don't have a real medical degree or anything like that. So I, I don't do this to make money. And this is just a disclaimer for everyone. And I want, this is a very classical slide. I give this slide when I lecture at medical uh, schools. Uh, I don't teach students, I teach faculty. Um, I have over a hundred studies published. I have several chapters in various text, medical textbooks. And so um, in teaching to faculty, I teach them first, detect the cause. What, what is the, why does this person that comes to see you, why do they have, I don't know, Hashimoto or autoimmune thyroiditis? Why do they have uh, fatigue? Why do they have these things? Why don't you find the cause instead of saying, oh, you have fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, et cetera, et cetera, and all these things. Let's start treating you. Well, why don't you try to find the cause and then remove the cause? And once you've removed the cause, you repair the damage. It's not rocket science. So there's a medical journal that published a very comprehensive study on mycotoxins. And I'm sorry, on, on Lyme. And uh, this were 29 members from an interdisciplinary guideline group, 19 medical scientific specialty societies, all of which are members of the societies, the Association of Scientific Medical Societies in Germany, as well as the Paul Ehrlich Society, the Robert Koch Institute, the German Borreliosis Society, and three patient organizations, okay? And on top of that, they said, well, all these special medical scientific specialties, cardiology, neurology, rheumatology, pediatrics, uh, obstetrics, gynecology, uh, pulmonary medicine, um, internal medicine, family medicine, all these got together, okay? And then plus three patient organizations on Lyme. And after getting together, they joined up with representatives from Austria and Switzerland, all of whom had previously been co-authors of the guidelines on Lyme neuroborreliosis and served as a, a advisory uh, capacity. So there was the experts of three different countries of all the medical specialties got together to decide on Lyme. And here was their conclusion, okay? Um, they agreed that this disease can be real, reliably diagnosed and permanently stopped with a two to three week course of antibiotic treatment. But there's this widespread fear that Lyme disease can lead to a, a variety of non-specific syndromes such as chronic pain, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, despite antibiotic treatment. This view often leads to repeated courses of antibiotic uh, th treatment being given for several months at a time, sometimes with serious side effects, and there's been even a few deaths. 
So what am I what am I mentioning here is like, for instance, I've seen patients who've been on antibiotics for four years, six years, the longest, nine years, and they're still sick. And their doctors keep giving them antibiotics, 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 intravenous antibiotics, oral antibiotics, et cetera. Can you imagine the state of their microbiome, their gut microbiome? The gut microbiome is 80% of your immune system is there, and it's totally destroyed by antibiotics. So let's go forward and see what they said. And this is a, another study that kind of mimics the, the other one. Lyme disease is caused by several different species of Borrelia burgdorferi, the sensulato complex, okay? Lyme Borrelia. And it's the most common vector-borne disease in the Northern Hemisphere, meaning um, United States, Canada, Northern Hemisphere of Germany. And that the CDC, you know, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, estimate there's nearly 500 new cases every year diagnosed and treated for Lyme disease in the United States. Okay? So having said that, the other thing is, is it's an infection. Okay, it's like any other bacteria. The uh, this is caused by a spirochete. The other famous spirochete that's been around in humanity for many, many, many years, not dozens of years, hundreds of years, is syphilis. Now, if you have a patient with syphilis, you give them a shot of penicillin G and they're done. So anyway, there's five species of Borrelia burgdorferi that, are, that cause disease in humans, okay? And they have been identified as the responsible organisms. Now, what is the first sign? It's usually an expanding cutaneous lesion. It looks like a target, and it's termed erythema migrans, which means it it may be in one spot, then it switches to another words, migrates, okay? And it's accompanied with nonspecific syndrome, headaches, fever, malaise, fatigue, myalgias, and arthralgias. So I always ask my patients, did you have a week where you had a fever and you, you know, your, your joints had aches and pains and that migrated from shoulder to knee to hip to uh, um, elbows, wrists, etc. And if they say yes, then that's a clue that they may have Lyme. If you don't ask them this and you just do a test, you're treating a test, not a human being. Okay, so having said that, let's go to the next one. If untreated, this bacteria, which are spirochetes, can disseminate to other organ systems, heart, joints, central nervous system, and Lyme neuroborreliosis, which results from the infection to the central nervous system, is the most common extracutaneous, meaning it's not on the skin. The next after skin, the next most common is in Europe and the second one most common and such in North America, okay? So it's skin where you have the, the target lesion and the second most common, it's the central nervous system, okay? It infects the brain. That central nervous system is the brain. So we know that polyradiculitis, inflammation that affects multiple spinal nerve roots and or cranial nerves, there's 12 cranial nerves for those who remember their neuroanatomy, and it's the most common clinical manifestation of neuroborreliosis in adults, okay? So if the meninges are involved, like in meningitis, this is called 
neuritis. It's also called the Guerin Bujadou uh, Banois syndrome or Banois syndrome for short, okay, after the erythema. So you get that target lesion, and this is the second most common manifestation of Lyme in adults. We're going to look at children later. And cranial nerve deficits arise in about 60% of patients with this Banworth syndrome. In more than 80% of those, facial nerve involvement leads to a typical facial palsy, which is both sides in one third of the cases, in two thirds of the cases, it's only one side of the face. Um, and the palsy is like uh, one half of your face is kind of like paralyzed, okay, or it doesn't work. So cranial nerves, which arise in 60%, and in more, the facial nerve involvement leads to a typical, uh, oh, I already gave you this, so, sorry. So the Banworth syndrome shows up as a severe, uh, like a herpes zoster-like pain that is worse at night, it gets worse at, when you're going, trying to get to sleep. And it responds very poorly, if at all, to pain medication, it has a burning, stabbing, biting, or tearing characteristic. 75% of patients develop neurological deficits in one to four weeks, generally in the form of a flaccid paralysis or a segmental sensory disturbance. Um, other clinical features, infection of the nervous system, central nervous, the brain, is seen in two to four percent of all cases of Lyme neuroborreliosis. In the beginning, it's insidious, it, with a tendency to slowly get worse over a period of months to years. The spinal cord is the most commonly affected part of the central nervous system, and it, it's a myelitis, and it shows up as a spastic ataxic gait and bladder dysfunction. The brain is affected, as in encephalitis, in 60% of the cases, and the cranial nerves in 40% of the cases, okay? Now, the neurological manifestation in children is facial nerve palsy, about 55%, and lymphocytic meningitis in children again. What about, how do you, okay, so you have this patient. What do you do to evaluate them diagnostically? So Borrelia-specific IgM antibodies you can get those in after about the third week after exposure and IgG antibodies after the six weeks. So first three weeks, after the first three weeks, it's IgM. And after six weeks, it's IgG. For those of you who may remember your immunology classes, IgM is the, always the first antibody to appear. And after that, it fades away and immunoglobulin G steps in, okay? So in late or chronic Lyme neuroborreliosis, high Borrelia-specific IgG antibody concentration should, in principle, always be found. So after the six weeks, you're going to find this IgG antibody to Borrelia. So it's an IgG test. Notice that it's not any other kind of test. Both IgG and IgM antibodies can persist for several years despite a clinically healed infection. So there's a lot of healthcare practitioners who repeat the test after so much time 
oh, it's still there. We've got to continue treating you. No, it's going to persist. You don't treat a test, you treat a human being. So make sure you don't make that mistake. Now, in, you can actually find in 5 to 20% of normal people, just everyday people who don't have any health issues, depending on what, where they live and what age group they are, you're going to find antibodies to Lyme, Borrelia, in 5 to 20% of those patients. Like, for instance, Minnesota. 20% of people who live in Minnesota have Lyme, Borrelia antibodies, but they're not sick. They're fine. They don't have any disease. They don't have any manifestations. They're, they don't have any complaints. What does that tell you? That you may, you know, just because the test is positive, you don't need to treat it. So in continuing on with the diagnostic part, in consequence, the positive serum finding alone does not establish that the patient is infected with Borrelia. It should be ordered only if there's adequate clinical suspicion, meaning you, you did a full medical history and a full examination, physical examination for active Borreliosis. Otherwise, its predictive value will be low. Now, what are not what are tests that you should not do that don't have a diagnostic value? You see the antigen detection in bodily fluids, like I don't know, urine and things like that. The PCR on serum or urine, it doesn't. It's, it's not the right test. The lymphocyte transformation, transformation test, the immunospot assay is no good. Then the xenodiagnosis, which is the tick larvae are allowed to suck blood from a patient with success, who that, that is, may be having Lyme borreliosis and then examine for Borrelia. Okay. The v VCS test which is used for this and and um, mold and mycotoxin that's a worthless test okay um the detection of so-called l forms or spheroplasts no good immune complexes the cd57 which is used by so many as oh this is a marker no it's not and then the rapid test on the serum. It has a sensitivity of 18 to 32%, meaning that 88 to 70% is off. It's not a positive test. Don't use these, any of these tests. Also, don't use, let me go back here. There's a famous lab that does IFA, immunofluorescent assay. That does not help either. Okay. So in the treatment, these organizations over Germany, Austria, Switzerland, top people, all having published, etc., it was concluded that steroids for the facial nerve palsies due to Lyme, do not use it. It has deleterious effects, okay? It's not to be used. Don't use steroids. Contrary to what a lot of internet specialists who opine, it's their opinion. It's not medical science. It's just an opinion. It's anecdotal stories about it, okay? In general, treatment with antibiotics is recommended for all patients who have neurological manifestations that are typical of Lyme disease, inflammatory central CSF changes, okay? 
uh, cerebrospinal changes. And positive Borrelia antibodies. In possible, not actual, Lyme neuroboliosis, CSF findings are either you didn't do a spinal tap or it was normal. Treatment with antibiotics can be considered, but only after a thorough differential diagnosis evaluation that has not led to the diagnosis of any other condition. So they did not have any other condition. They only had this. Well, that means you have to test them for other potential disorders that cause effects. Now, in early Lyme neuroboliosis, the duration for treatment was seven to 14 days, not months, please. I've seen so many of these patients who've been on antibiotics for years and they're still sick. So what do you treat it with? Here's the antibiotics. Okay, any of these are okay in early and late Lyme. Okay, now, yes, some of these are IV, correct? And you use them in adults and pediatrics. But look at the last column. For how long do you use them? Even under late Lyme, it's three weeks at the most. That's it. What about the choice of antibiotics and side effects? The data does not show any of the substances tested to be one is better than the other, okay? It doesn't, it, that has no effect. And so the antibiotic has to be chosen in consideration for specific to the patient. And you have to ask them about allergies. How old are you? Are, Potentially, are you pregnant or not? And the mode and frequency of application. How, do you, how often do you give it? And how do you give it orally, intravenously, et cetera? And here is late line, okay? They looked at the medical, all the medical studies, and they searched them, okay, in a systematic way, did not yield any not one, controlled trials in which antibiotic treatment for late neuroboli was explicitly studies. There are no studies that look at that. Well, what does that mean? A risk-benefit analysis yields no scientifically supported reason to change the current recommendations to, of two to three weeks of antibiotic treatment for the typical patient with late Lyme. Got that? Two to three weeks, not months and not years, as so many of my patients have been treated for Lyme and still feel sick. Okay, this is that post-treatment Lyme disease treatment or chronic treat, uh, neuro uh, borreliosis, et cetera. And it, this has been talked about for decades, okay? Is it going to, what do we do? How do we treat it? Oh, well, we should give them antibiotics, okay? But there is no clear differentiation in the meaning, in the meaning from one or the other. What does that bring about in your practice? It means that there's a subset of patients with this Lyme neuroborreliosis that experience lingering symptoms. And they persist despite the, the right anti antibiotic or antimicrobial therapy. The, the cause, the etiology of such symptoms is unclear and there are no effective biomarkers. In other words, there's no effective tests and there's no effective treatment strat strategies that for this. These are all effective biomarker and treatment strategies. There are none. They're lacking. There's no proof or evidence 
that medical evidence that these have any effect. So here's again more on this post-treatment Lyme or chronic Lyme, etc. The therapeutic benefit of the antibiotics for patients with persistent non-specific symptoms after the correct or incorrect diagnosis of chronic Lyme borreliosis, patients with so-called uh, post-treatment, et cetera, was looked at and studied. And what was the outcome? No lasting improvement was found in any trial that was published. No benefit was found with respect to either of the two endpoints, which is fatigue and quality of life. Did it change their fatigue? Did it change their quality of life? Even though they continued giving antibiotics, nothing, no change. So no use in giving chronic treatment with antibiotics, okay? So the antibiotic effects arose in all these three trials in 25 to 43% of the patients, in other words, one fourth to well over almost half of the P patients. These included, among other uh, symptoms, diarrhea, allergic reactions, cholecystitis, thromboembolisms, and gastrointestinal bleeding. And in three case, cases, the antibiotic complications were life threatening. You don't want to do that for any of your patients. So in continuing, most patients who have Lyme disease respond well to antibiotic drug therapy and their disease resolves. So although persistent infection is often considered as an explanation, in other words, oh, you still have symptoms, you must still have an infection. The evidence of infection in the post-antibiotic drug period is very limited in humans. So two clinical trials in Europe of antibiotic drug efficacy, did it work, establishes only two out of 244 patients had microbial treatment failure. So the others didn't. Okay, so no antibiotics necessary after that 14 to 21 day period. So findings from those studies are substanti substantiated by five clinical trials in the United States and Europe. And these failed to show any improvement of the chronic Lyme with more antibiotic treatment. It doesn't, you don't need that long-term antibiotic. You only need 14 to 21 days. And I'm gonna take that up in a moment. So what if you continue to have symptoms? Well, if you, if you have the right diagnosis with the right treatment, the patient is well, common sense, right? But if you have the wrong diagnosis and or the wrong treatment, patients get years of treatment and it does not help. Again, common sense. I published an article in three years ago. No, it's four years. Wow. Okay. Uh, Lyme disease and mycotoxins. How do they, how to tell between the two? because both of them have the same symptoms. So maybe after you treat the Lyme and they continue with symptoms, could it be mycotoxins instead of just Lyme? Don't keep treating and uh, the, oh, the test is showing up as positive. I showed you how IgM and IgG antibodies continue for years after successful treatment. So obviously if they continue with symptoms, there's something else going on. And that something else is basically mycotoxins. And the most accurate test and the most precise test are antibody tests, okay? 
And these are for IgG and IgE me measurements for 12 different mycotoxins. Binders, because a lot of people use binders. So they've looked at binders, both for uh, patients with Lyme and patients with mycotoxins. Well, you know, all the usual ones that patients are prescribed, they're not, they only neutralize one mycotoxin. They're ineffective in all. Okay, in addition, they bind vital my, vitamins as well, macro and micro elements. And they say, yes, but you've got to take it four hours before or after you eat, et cetera. There's no, this is the only study. This is the only study in humans. There are studies in chickens, in turkeys, in rabbits, in sheep, in piglets. Those aren't human. I don't treat any of those. I treat human beings. So binders do not work. And then they say, well, it's from food, okay? So they looked at that. And they looked at worst case acute exposure. So look at the second little shorter paragraph. A patient weighing 170 pounds would have to eat 14 pounds of oatmeal at one sitting. This is rancid oatmeal with molds and mycotoxins in it, or... 20 slices of rancid moldy bread to get that. So it's not from food is what this shows. Okay. So the other thing is urine testing for mycotoxins. Okay. So this study that was published just in October of last year, they are saying, if you want to do urine testing, for mycotoxins, you need to do it several times during the day, okay? And because there's a lot of factors, gender, age, diet, muscle mass, it's not an accurate test. And on top of that, in the same study, they showed that the ELISA method to detect mycotoxins in human serums comes with significant accuracy, precision, and specificity. So this is the test that my micro lab does. Now, here's the point. The point is I see patients who were told they had Lyme's and they had a test done that showed Lyme and they were treated for Lyme and they were continually treated some six months, some one year, some four years, the one that's the longest is nine years, and still feeling bad. Then I test them for mycotoxins, antibodies, with my microlab test, not urine. And what happens? They light up. You tr start treating them within a few months. They're feeling better for the first time after years of antibiotics. That's the important point here. If you have a patient after treatment of 14 to 21 days and they're still sick, look elsewhere. And the most common elsewhere are mycotoxins as shown by this published study here. And if you would like a copy of this study, let send me an email, I'll send it to you. It's on PubMed. National Library of Medicine, and I'll be, you know, you can access it there or you can ask me and I'll send it to you. And here's something from the CDC. It's use of unvalidated urine mycotoxin tests for the clinical diagnosis of illness. They say don't use that for as a clinical diagnosis, don't use urine mycotoxins. Now, serum blood testing is highly precise for mycotoxins in a moldy environment, okay? Not in a, not from outside. Urine test changes because it measures mycotoxins excreted from food, not your indoor environment. And it can change day to day, week to week. So for example, here's this young woman. She was treated for Lyme and she developed what is called SIBO. And she took these pictures herself and wrote this. 
So pre-itraconazole, the treatment for mycotoxins, June 10th, okay, 2021, to September 12th, three months. Look at the difference, okay? So that tells you, so you could treat this patient with, for SIBO with the SIBO stuff, but it won't work. Okay. So here is what a, a, a healthcare professional sent me. Uh, just talked to another patient, a man who was suicidal, overwhelmed, very sick, very ill, sick, fatigued, could barely function, not able to work. Treated for mycotoxins, he is living the dream, working, feeling great, living life. And he was ordering extra tests to share. He's extremely grateful. Okay, so here is what you send to me and write to me so I can send you anything. I have over 100 publications, including on all kinds of subjects, but especially on molds, mycotoxins, Lyme, etc. So you want the Lyme study? Here's my email address. You want the mold, mycotoxins, the brain, the gut, and misconceptions, just write to me. But the point here is the following. Lyme disease is treated for 14 to 21 days, and that's it. And if you test for Lyme disease after treatment, remember that the tests will show for several years you still have the antibody, although it's successfully treated. So you treat the patient, you don't treat the test result, what it says on a piece of paper, okay? I want to also point out to you that there's only one Lyme test in the United States that is patented. That's how good it is. And it's by Immunosciences Lab. Immunosciences Lab in Los Angeles. It's not by any of the other labs who want you to keep testing patients because they're hoping you test, you treat the lab test and not the patient. So that's the point here, is that if your patient has Lyme disease and you treat them for 14 to 21 days, depending on each, each individual case, and they still have symptoms later, it's probably because they also have mycotoxins. And that's been showed in published studies. It is not the anecdotes you see on the internet. The other point I want to make here that you should understand, and this is very important, and it's called cross-reactivity. What that means is that if you're positive for a toxin such as mycotoxin, your Lyme test is going to light up because of cross-reactivity, and so is Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, herpes virus, and all these other viral tests, but you don't have them. It's just a cross-reactivity. And let me help you understand something else about these other disorders such as Babesia and Bartonella. Babesia affects 0 0.0004% four percent of the population okay yet people treat that and bartonella one percent don't go by anecdotes go by what science teaches you and tells you from all these critical trials remember these studies were done by a consensus of every all the important medical specialties from three different countries. And they came to the conclusion, 14 to 21 days. And then that the antibodies to Borrelia still continue for a long time, although the patient has already been 
successfully treated. That's don't keep treating it. Now, does anyone have any questions? Please uh, ask, um, etc. I'm happy to help. If you want to send, shoot me an email, I'll be happy to answer you and tell you what you need to do um, so that, that you can uh, really help your, your patients. There's so many people being treated for Lyme that don't have Lyme anymore, or they never really had it because it was a cross reaction, okay? So remember, you have to treat the patient, not the test result. And because there's so many people on the internet that still do that wrong, does not cease to be wrong because the majority share in it. Tolstoy said that, by the way. Leo Tolstoy, the Russian writer, author of several famous books. I hope you benefited from this, this uh, webinar on Lyme and the real studies that show on a consensus basis that you this is what the real Lyme is. It's not all this other stuff. And, you know, I, I can't help but thinking that doctors want it to continue because that way they have a patient that keeps coming back and coming back and coming back. 14 to 21 days. Yep, and that's taken care of. Um, there's a question about what to, what items to clean versus to discard when mold is found in a house and remediation takes place. Yes, basically things like towels, sheets, pillows. There's a study that shows that in a moldy home, 100% of the pillows have mold in the pillows, okay? Inside the pillow. So whether it's a feather pillow or not a feather pillow. So throw out your pillows, your sheets, your towels, clothes you can wash, but you've got to start the wash with one cup of plain white vinegar and then wash it two more times with soap. And after that, after each wash dry, rewash, dry, rewash. The first one is with vinegar. Any other question, folks? And I really hope I've shown you the real, that you've understood that the real um, point of Lyme, and there's so much of it that is wrong. Um, someone asks me, how do you test for mold in the home? Well, there's three companies are commend two on the West Coast and one on the East Coast. So if you send me an email and telling me which coast, you know, you live east of the Mississippi or west of the Mississippi, and I'll tell you what those, what those people are. They're experts. They know what they're doing. Um, uh, does the same apply to co-infections? Absolutely. Absolutely. Elder coast, et cetera. Not seven to 14 days, 14 to 21 days. Not seven to 14. 14 to 21. And you saw the antibiotics that were used. You saw which tests don't help in any way in diagnosing it. So use the right test. I always recommend immunosciences Lyme test because it's the only test that is patented for Lyme specifically. It's called a multi-peptide test. And it's been written about in medical journals and published. So it's not just the lab saying use this. It's published studies. Otherwise, it would have never gotten a patent. <clears throat> All righty. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed this. 
Um, a week from today, I'm doing my usual tea time with Dr. Campbell. You can um, join, ask me any questions about anything in medicine. I've been in, doing this for 40 years. Um, I know what I'm talking about because I've seen so, so many thousands and thousands and thousands of patients and treated them successfully. I was the medical director for the Center of Immune and Toxic Disorders in Houston for 25 years. Um, and I'll help you with, I don't, whatever. It could be about heavy metals. It could be about Lyme and mycotoxins or any other disorders, any autism, um, Alzheimer, multiple sclerosis, uh, Parkinson's. All those things you can ask me about because all can be treated. Okie doke. So folks, I hope again that um, you learned something tonight. I'm going to send you a two-page quiz. You've got to pass with 80%. Just kidding. And here's my email, immunedoctor at gmail.com. Thank you all for listening. Um, in two weeks from now, I'm doing another Every other week, I do a webinar. So two weeks from now, this is another webinar. In one week, I'm doing every other week from the webinar is Tea Time with Dr. Campbell, where you can ask me anything. All righty, folks. Um, take care. All the best. Have a great rest of the week. And thank you for uh, being here at this webinar. Mm -hmm.